This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to AI Answers, weekly updates from the world's leading valuation authority. My name is Bill Garber, Director of Government and External Relations for the Appraisal Institute. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we're teeing up two issues for discussion. One, impairment in real estate, and two, appraiser licensing issues during the COVID-19 pandemic. On the issue of impairment, we are joined by Melissa Loffing, MAI, and James Ferrer, MAI of Cushman Wakefield's Valuation and Advisory Practice. On the matter of appraiser licensing, we're joined by Jim Park of the Appraisal Subcommittee and my colleague, Sue Serratis in the Appraisal Institute Education Department. Let's jump into the issue of impairment first. This is an issue that we're gonna hear a, a lot more about in the coming months. Melissa and Jim, thanks for taking time to walk us through the issue with tips for evaluation professionals. Thanks, Bill, um, and thanks for having us here today. And thanks everyone for listening and joining this uh, webinar. Um, the topic today is really where the valuation world meets the accounting world. And we want to focus on valuation for financial purposes, as that is truly a merger of these two worlds. Any company that follows GAAP has to comply with the Financial Accounting Standards Board or FASB's rules and regulations, many of which involve the valuation of real property. For example, you may have heard of business combinations, fresh start accounting, or impairments. And at different points in the market cycle, certain areas have tend to have more focus. And right now, given the current economic environment, you're really likely to hear a lot of words around impairment. So we thought it would be a good idea to discuss that today. And just as a fair warning, the accounting world has a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of accounting jargon and technical terms. We'll really try to keep those to a minimum um, and apologies in advance for, you know, some of these acronyms. Yeah, so while the extent and duration of the economic fallout from COVID pandemic is still unclear and still yet to be found, uh, companies start or need to consider a lot of accounting, disclosure, financial reporting matters while they're considering their annual and interim impairment analysis for indefinite live items, goodwill, and also long-lived assets uh, such as real estate. So today's focus will really be around the ASC 360 impairment of long-lived assets, said simply real estate, um, property, plant, and equipment. So before we get started, let me give you a quick highlight of our background. Um, my name is Jim Farr. I've been working with Cushman for about two years. Prior to that, I was with KPMG as a real estate specialist working with audit teams on very similar uh, problems to this. And Melissa? Thanks, Jim. Um, and yes, as Jim mentioned, my background is similar to his. We've worked together both here at Cushman and Wakefield, where I've been for a little over three years, and also in our prior lives at KPMG. Um, where I was um, for about 14 years. Prior to that, I had more of a traditional um, valuation background. I did valuation for financing purposes and estate tax purposes. So um, both of us have been around quite a while. Um, but let's get down to business and start to talk about a little bit about impairment. ASC 360 is one of FASB's accounting standards codifications that provides guidance with respect to impairment testing for a company's long-lived assets, such as property, plant, and equipment. While it's not mandatory for a company to use an outside appraisal firm, a lot of times that can help mitigate some of the common pitfalls when performing in-house valuations. In order to perform a long-lived asset impairment analysis, the first step would really be to determine the asset group. And an asset group is the grouping of assets and liabilities at the lowest level for which identifiable cash flows are largely independent of the cash flows of other assets and liabilities. 
Now that is just a very long, fancy way of saying um, it is the it, it would be similar to a typical real estate income producing asset for most of us. Um, but the accounting world likes to make everything very fancy. Yeah, exactly. So you would be looking at your standard hotels, shopping centers, um, manufacturing plants, uh, even if they had multiple buildings or multiple parcels together, you would look at everything as one economic unit, similar to the shopping center where it may have an, an anchor tenant with inline and pad sites, you would be looking at that all as one economic unit and determining the value that way. Exactly, Jim. Um, and ASC 360 prescribes a three-step process. And so right now I will give you a brief description of each of the three steps, and then we will go into a little bit more detail. So step one is to answer the question, has there been a triggering event? If triggering indications are present, then you go on to step two. Step two is the recoverability test. Now the recoverability test involves summing the undiscounted cash flows of the asset group, which is called the assets recoverable value. The assets recoverable value is then compared to the asset group's carrying value. And if the re recoverable value is below the carrying value, then step three is performed. The carrying value is also referred to as the book value, and that is the value of um, an asset on the company's balance sheet, which is essentially the cost of the asset less any depreciation that's been taken over time. Yeah, so you can easily see there, if an asset was purchased a long time ago and had uh, a, a lot of depreciation taken against it, it should have a lower carrying value and it may make the diff, it may make failing step two more difficult. Exactly. So then we're moving on to step three and performing the fair value analysis of the asset group. This step is performed to calculate the amount of the actual impairment. So the valuation in step three will be consistent with how you would typically determine the market value of an asset, um, i.e. a discounted cash flow analysis, sales comparison approach, and even a cost approach if it was a special use asset. Um, the, the amount of the impairment is typically is, is equal to the difference between the carrying amount of the long-lived asset and the fair value of that asset. Now, um, a little more detail on each of the steps. Um, going back to step one, the co a company, for step one, a company will qualitatively identify if an event or trigger has negatively impacted the business and the underlying group of assets. More specifically, when facts and circumstances indicate an, assets, an asset group's carrying value may not be recoverable. Some examples of circumstances straight from the guidance are a significant decrease in the market price of a long-lived asset, a significant adverse change in the extent or manner in which a long-lived asset is being used or in its physical condition, or third, a significant adverse change in legal factors or in the business climate that could affect the value of a long-lived asset. Yeah, so said simply, a couple of real world examples that would, uh, would trigger this impairment and be qualitative would be if the building sustained substantial fire damage or, you know, you have um, an external event, something like September 11th that happened that impacted the broader economy and the income producing nature of the properties. And then, of course, we're going through it right now, COVID-19 and the forced closure that the government is instilling on basically all businesses, especially around hotels, uh, restaurants, and a lot of retail, um, retail applications. So now, next is step two, and this is really the quantitative analysis of the recoverability test. Uh, the company must determine whether the carrying amount is greater than the, the long-lived asset value. Um, so this is done by comparing the total amount of the undiscounted cash flows of the long-lived asset to its carrying amount. And we keep stressing that undiscounted cash flow because as most appraisers are 
more than aware of discounted cash flows, this one is a little bit of, will be a little bit of a foreign concept at the beginning. So if the total of the undiscounted cash flows exceed the carrying value of the asset, the carrying amount is deemed to be recoverable. If the opposite is true, the carrying amount is not recoverable and an impairment loss for the long-lived asset can be recognized. The total undiscounted cash flows include only the future cash flows that are directly associated with the use and eventual disposal of the asset. These estimated future cash flows should be made for the remaining useful life of the asset and held across that holding period. And that's a great point, Jim. Um, but we've also noticed that some clients have had discussions with their auditors over looking at the impair uh, over the recoverability test, the time period um, over the holding period versus the remaining economic life of the asset. Um, the assets, it's important to note that the estimate should incorporate, incorporate the company's internal assumptions on how they use, intend to use the asset in the future. And these assumptions should, should be within reason in relation to assumptions they have used in the past. However, if alternate methods of recovering the carrying amount are being considered, or if a range is estimated for the amount of possible future cash flows associated with the likely course of action, the likelihood of those possible outcomes should be considered. A probability weighted approach should be considered when estimating the likelihood of those possible outcomes. All right, next on to my favorite part, the measurement of the impairment loss. And this is really the point that I think a lot of, a lot of the appraisers and the audience here will really get involved. Clients will start to reach out and ask for your help in determining the fair value that way they can measure the impairment loss. So if the carrying amount of the long-lived asset was determined to be unrecoverable in step two, the impairment loss needs to be estimated and needs to be calculated. In order to calculate the impairment loss, the fair value of the asset group must be determined. So the fair value referenced here is determined underneath the guidance of ASC 820, which is really the, the fair value uh, definition underneath the accounting standards. So ASC 820 states that the measurement date of the fair value of the asset or liability should be based on assumptions that a market participant would use when pricing the asset. Said differently, this is no different than how you would typically measure market value for, for a property underneath a FIREA or a market value consideration. Once the fair value of the asset is determined, it is compared to the carrying amount of the asset group to derive the impairment loss. The excess of the carrying amount of the long-lived asset versus the fair value should be recognized as the impairment loss. Once the impairment is recognized, the adjusted carrying value becomes the long-lived asset's new cost basis, and it should be depreciated over the remaining useful life of the asset. That's, that step is typically performed by the actual company. So it's usually when we get involved, we're asked to determine the fair value and then the company will calculate the actual impairment loss and then apply it against their books. Exactly. Um, I think, Bill, can you switch the slide now? Thank you. Um, yes, that's perfect. Um, so now let's talk about how this, um, how an, Valuation for financial reporting purposes, specifically impairment, may differ from a traditional appraisal. And with all the dry guidance and technical discussion out of the way, let's kind of get into some of those details. Yeah, I think there are a lot of differences to exist between the two, but we're going to try to cover a couple of the major ones here, and you're going to see that on the slide. The first major difference is going to be the scope of work. I think that at the beginning of this, when you are engaged to perform this type of analysis, you want to make sure that the scope of work is well defined and everybody being you as the appraiser and the company and the auditors understand their roles and responsibilities within this process. We have been asked really to assist with just determining the fair value all the way up to helping the clients identify impairment triggers and working through their undiscounted cash flow analysis. So step one, two, and three, but most of the time it's just step three. So when in doubt, ask the client to have a scoping call, including the external auditor. This will help ensure that everyone has an agreement on the scope before any work has been undertaken. 
And um, another key difference is the review process, um, which it also um, underscores the importance of having that call up front to make sure that everybody's on the same page with respect to the scope of work. Um, with the review process, it differs a little bit from your typical bank review in that you will have multiple levels and multiple parties that will be reviewing your report. The first level of the review is the client um, who will want to see the, re the report likely before they pass it on to their auditor and may have some questions with respect to certain, certain assumptions you've used, where they may have differed from assumptions they've used in their internal analyses and in the past. Mm -hmm. And then next would be the auditor and potentially also the auditor's own real estate specialist. Each level will bring a different level of understanding and expectations to the review. Um, typically, the auditor's real estate specialist will have an appraisal background of some sort. They may be um, state certified or hold their MAI. These are um, this role is something that Jim and I were involved in when we were um, when we were at KPMG. So we did this kind of work before. Um, but a lot of times you might have some smaller accounting firms that do not have real estate specialists in-house. So you may have some questions that are a little bit more elementary in nature. In nature. You also may be expected to provide documentation, for example, printouts of CoStar sales that you've used, um, and you should expect and budget for this. And also that this review process can be quite lengthy. You may get questions from your client right away, but then you may not get questions from the audit team for you know up to months, months later. So just kind of expect and budget for this. Yeah, exactly. So the next is going to be reporting format. Uh, we have typically seen impairment engagements prepared underneath both the appraisal and restrictive formats prescribed by USPAP. Uh, typically, the the analysis is what the client's really after. So a lot of practitioners will use a restricted use format. Um, the, but the key takeaway here is that the reports need to be use path compliant and prepared in accordance with your professional standards, being the appraisal institute and any other memberships that you may hold. Um, and also um, in accordance with any state uh, state guidelines as well. Exactly. And um, we all know as um, valuation specialists as appraisers that our files have to contain the same level of documentation regardless of the format of the report. Um, again, keep in mind that you may be asked to provide the documentation and if the questions come months after you've completed the analysis, going back to document the sales you used in your analysis may be frustrating. Um, and remember that auditors love to tick and tie back to original documents. Um, other areas where the, um, these valuations may differ in terms of reporting format include the intended use. Um, it's important to note that in these cases, the intended use would be for financial reporting purposes. For example, for impairment would be um, under ASC 360. The intended user, um, keep in mind this will be your client as well as the as well as their external auditor, um, know that they will need to have the audit team review the work, so include them as an intended user as well. The um, Another point would be the definition of value. Um, Jim men mentioned it above, but it's worth repeating. Fair value um, for financial reporting purposes is referenced in the ASC um, 820 guidance, and that's defined there. The um, data value is another, um, another point, and it's just important that you confirm with your client up front at the onset of the engagement um, what your data value will be. The definition of fair value per ASC 820 um, refers to this as the measurement date, and typically, typically for impairment purposes, this will be at the end of a quarter or at year end, so it's important that you have this discussion up front. And Jim, am I missing anything? I think the the last, really the last topic that we haven't discussed yet is how a lot of the audience would be engaged for this type of work. Typically, our, cl our clients, the companies will reach out to us being the CFOs, the chief financial officers, chief accounting officers, 
and controllers will reach out and help define out the scope and ask us to help participate within the impairment analysis process. Um, sometimes we are brought on board with other business valuation firms and also other audit firms that may help us um, help uh, different companies uh, with the analysis. And just to throw it out there, there, there are a lot of training options out there for this type of work. Uh, many firms, many of the larger accounting and consulting firms, such as PwC, EY, Deloitte, KPMG, Duffin Phelps, Grant Thor, and BDO are currently hosting webinars on impairment and really this loss. Um, and they're also publishing white papers and articles out there. So keep an eye out for that and attend those sessions. And many of them actually have a playback option. So if you saw something a, a week or two later, um, you can always jump on there, fast forward to where we're going. And Bill, unless you have any other questions, um, I think that we're a wrap. Lessa and Jim, thanks very much for joining us. We're gonna try to pivot uh, by using another acronym similar to accounting standards codification and turn to the appraisal subcommittee the other ASC to talk about appraiser licensing issues. Uh, we're pleased to have Jim Park, Executive Director of the Appraisal Subcommittee with us, along with my colleague, Sue Serratus, Director of Education within the Appraisal Institute, talk about appraiser licensing issues. I'm gonna go ahead and flip a slide here uh, over to the Appraisal Subcommittee website. Um, Jim Park, thank you for joining us today. What can you tell us about the actions taken by the appraisal subcommittee to date uh, relative to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you, Bill. Um, hello, everyone. <clears throat> I hope uh, this message finds you and yours all safe and healthy. Uh, and I want to express my appreciation uh, on behalf of the subcommittee to uh, Bill, Sue, and the entire appraisal institute for, uh, for having me on. Uh, like everyone else, the uh, COVID-19 outbreak has uh, definitely reprioritized our uh, business and personal lives. Uh, today, I just wanted to share with you a few things. The subcommittee, working with our other regulatory partners uh, in the states and the foundation, uh, what we've been working on to uh, provide relief. As this crisis unfolded in early March, it was it was clear right away that states and, and appraisers uh, both needed technical assistance, as well as regulatory relief. Uh, state governments, including their appraisal regulatory systems, uh, are began moving to uh, remote duty, uh, varied work schedules and other forms of restrictions uh, in both their work and personal lives. Uh, and the states remain in uh, different uh, capacities in terms of their ability to uh, perform their regulatory duties. On March 18th, uh, the Appraisal Foundation uh, Subcommittee and ARO, the Association of Appraisal Regulatory Officials, uh, sent out a joint memorandum letting stakeholders know that we're all working together to provide uh, the needed relief and technical advice and support them in, in every way we can uh, at this difficult time. <clears throat> As an important message of unity, I think in a time of crisis, and I want to thank both ARO and the Appraisal Foundation uh, for agreeing to issue that memo. I also want to thank the AQB for working so diligently uh, with us uh, to get out much of the needed relief and technical assistance and advice to the states and appraisers uh, around education and, and license renewals. Uh, at the subcommittee, we've provided guidance to the state appraiser and AMC programs on the flexibilities provide, provided in our policy statements. Our policy statements are our guidance to the states in terms of how we expect them to uh, comply with Title 11. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that guidance here in just a minute. Um, we've also provided guidance around uh, appraiser and AMC registry functions, as well as temporary practice. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Wayne Miller and the Appraisal Standards Board for uh, quickly putting out uh, Q&As related to the pandemic, uh, particularly um, related to interior uh, inspections for appraisal assignments. I know that uh, that uh, information has been uh, both timely and, and useful. 
as I mentioned, state governments are functioning at different levels around the country, uh, with most, if not all, using some level of social distancing uh, in restricted work environments. We expect state appraisal regulatory programs and legislatures to be functioning at limited capacities uh, for some time across the country. So we're, we have asked um, uh, the foundation boards to take that in consideration when they're proposing any future changes to the criteria or use path. Uh, Bill has our, our website up there uh, for you to see, the home page, uh, but there is more information uh, specifically addressing some of the issues we're talking about today during this webinar. If you go to ASC.gov, uh, particularly underneath our What's New section, you can find uh, more details on some of the things that we're going to talk about. With that, Bill, Sue, do you want me to uh, do you want to proceed with talking about the Q and A's? Yeah, if you could, um, maybe just touch on some of the high level high level questions that you've re you've received so far and issued some some guidance around. Sure. Well, immediately, of course, people had a lot of practical questions. Um, you have folks who are in the process of renewing their licenses, taking continuing education in order to renew their license. Uh, they may be requesting temporary practice permits. You know, while a lot of things have slowed or stopped uh, in the country to some degree, uh, there's still a lot of work being done. And as things now start to open up, these questions become even more and more practical. One of the first questions we started getting was around temporary practice. Uh, the subcommittee requires states to pro pre uh, process temporary practice applications. So a temporary practice uh, permit can be applied for to, uh, to perform appraisal assignments uh, in a state on a temporary basis. When one of those permits is requested, uh, the subcommittee requires states to process those within five days of the uh, completed application being provided. That's just an example of, of an area where uh, the subcommittee is providing relief to the states. That five-day requirement uh, will not be uh, will not be enforced uh, with the stringency that it has in the past until the states can get up and, and running. That may cause some problems for appraisers who are seeking uh, a temporary practice permit um, uh, to get uh, seeking to get that as quickly as possible. Uh, but we're all going to have to be patient with each other as we work through this. Uh, related to that, uh, some states require fingerprinting uh, background checks for temporary practice applicants. Uh, that's a state issue. Uh, there is no federal requirement for a uh, uh, fingerprint background check. So that's something that uh, appraisers will have to deal with at the, at the state level. Uh, in regard to the registry, uh, the appraiser and AMC registries are both uh, important parts of the industry as uh, clients, regulators, and others go to the registries on a continual basis to see if AMCs are registered and if uh, appraisers are registered as well. Um, so states were immediately concerned about their ability to submit updates to the registry uh, and appraisers uh, as well we're uh, concerned about that. Um, if states are working remotely or uh, for some reason they are, re are receiving uh, requests for changes to the registry or appraisers to be added to the registry, and if they are unable to successfully accomplish that themselves at the state end, they should, the states should reach out to their policy manager um, and we will uh, do what we can uh, to help the state in getting that information on there. Um, applications, uh, we have uh, received quite a number of, of uh, calls and questions about um, processing appraiser applications. A lot of state board meetings uh, have been canceled. Uh, due to the health emergency until further notice. Uh, so uh, we typically, uh, this is another case where we're, we're uh, allowing uh, states leeway uh, 
we typically require that a, an application be processed within 90 days. Uh, however, uh, we are, again, applying um, some restraint here in terms of our enforcement, and states need to document their file sufficiently to uh, uh, so that we, when we do get back out to do a compliance review, we understand the, the nature and the reason for the delay, uh, but as long as, as it's documented, it's, it's understood. Um, reciprocity, uh, a number of states still require uh, letters of good standing uh, from a uh, state uh, where a uh, uh, reciprocal uh, application is, is being filed. Uh, the subcommittee uh, continues to encourage states to rely on, a, on the uh, private side of the appraiser registry to verify uh, reciprocal applicants' uh, current status instead of asking for letters of good standing, and we'll continue to reinforce that with the states. It's really a much uh, better option to uh, to check the national registry, the private side of the registry. Uh, you're going to get a more contemporary answer, uh, and at a time like this, when uh, letters of good standing in the states might be difficult to uh, to produce and and send out. Uh, that's a good option for states to uh, uh, to use. And finally, in terms of enforcement, our disciplinary uh, states are concerned about again because their board meetings have been postponed or canceled in uh, in many cases, and it's unclear when they'll be able to uh, uh, start business, uh, regular business again. Uh, we again, the subcommittee has a requirement in our policy statements uh, that states process complaints uh, within a one-year timeline, unless uh, there is a specially documented circumstance. Uh, this is uh, the current uh, pandemic is certainly a, a special documented circumstance. So, if cases, if states are are uh, struggling with processing complaints within that one year time frame. Obviously, we still encourage them to process their complaints as quickly as they can uh, for everybody's good. But in some cases, they just may not be able to make that one year deadline at this point. And, and again, we will uh, uh, we will allow allow for that. Bill, Sue, uh, that yeah, thanks. completes thanks my remarks. Much. If you have other questions. Thanks very much, Jim, for the clarification. So we, we have a couple of practitioners with us today, and Melissa and Jim. I'm I'm curious what what's going on in your world uh, within your practice areas in relation to education and licensing. What are you facing any issues right now? Yeah, and this is Jim Farr. So Jim Park, it's it's great to talk to you. I've heard your name in many circles, especially in uh, USPAP classes. But one of the, a couple of the issues that we're seeing on my side is that most of, most of my team has multiple licenses across the, nationally across the U.S. Um, and renewing the licenses, certain states are requiring um, in class or uh, in class at education hours. And obviously we can't really get that done. Uh, so we see a little bit of pain point there. And then the other pain point um, with a little bit of the extra time that I have now, I was trying to get additional licenses through reciprocity, and certain states are requiring um, FBI fingerprints, as you mentioned, the letters of good standing, and also notaries, which um, I'm in a quarantine area, so we're, we're technically none of those businesses are open right now. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Jim. Do you have, Jim, do you have any thoughts uh, on it? On that issue, I know, I know it's a complicated one, and we deal with the the uh, federalism in the in our in our system of government, and uh, that's every day. But uh, practical reality, what, do you have any thoughts on that subject? Sure, it, it's an excellent question, and it's one of the first and most common questions we've received. Um, again, because people were in different. Um, places in terms of getting their continuing, continuing education in particular to renew their license. Um, as, as Bill just alluded to, uh, 
our system is one in which uh, the 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 AQB, uh, the appraiser qualification appraiser qualifications board, sets the uh, the minimum requirements, but the states can exceed them, and in in many cases the the states do exceed them. Um, on this education topic, uh, the AQB came out uh, very quickly and uh, made allowances for continuing education that is already approved uh, uh, by the state or by the course approval program. Uh, those continuing education um, classes can be converted to uh, this classroom continuing education classes can be converted to online courses without having to go through the through the some some of the same um, checks for uh, for distance education requirements and things like that. So so the states still have to in in many cases approve it and and uh, uh, deem that appropriate in their state. But from the federal side of the equation, the AQB has, has uh, made that allowance and uh, encouraged the subcommittee to, uh, uh, to use our discretion in allowing the states to, to do that, which, which we certainly will. But again, it's a state-by-state -state decision. Yeah, and where we have chapters, obviously we'll do our best to try to advance the interests of practitioners as best we can. Uh, given the, the current conditions and uh, to the interest of the client community, of course. And my colleague, Stu, uh, turning to you, I, this is a, an issue that's been near and dear to you as well. Um, and I know that we've been paying close attention to it. Uh, how is the Appraisal Institute's Education Department looking at this issue right now? Well, um, like you said, we're trying to keep really close tabs on what each state is allowing during this time, um, once the ASC and the AQB and the foundation put out the letter um, allowing for some exceptions, we, we're encouraging the chapters to make sure that their state where they're holding the virtual education is allowing it. And then to also be very clear when they're advertising it that students really need to check on if the state they're in approves it as well as the state that they're taking it in. Because now they have this opportunity where you know they might be able to get some continuing education from a chapter in a different state that's offering it. But we found that um, most of the states are allowing this virtual education. There's about three or four that are not allowing it. Um, so I just really encourage any licensee to be 100% sure that their state is gonna allow the virtual education during this time. We're running into some issues where some folks from one state took it in another state and now they're finding out it doesn't count in their state because their state didn't approve it. So it's tough to keep track of, but we're trying to really make sure that everybody knows what's going on before they take that education. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I know that's a tough issue and, and particularly in the environment, it's, it's fast uh, moving and changing and we seem to be getting uh, notices on a daily basis it's a difficult one to, to keep on top of but we appreciate everyone's insights this afternoon and helping share a little bit of insight and uh, quite a bit of knowledge and expertise on a couple of unrelated but very important topics um, i would just want to say thanks uh, to melissa and jim and jim and sue for uh, your time and uh, we hope that you can join us next week for our next AI Answers weekly updates from the world's leading valuation authority. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and everyone stay safe. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone.